Welcome to Out of the Box with Christine, the podcast for conscious entrepreneurs. Are you willing to step into your greatness? Are you ready to shine? Well, get ready, truth seeker. You're in for an amazing ride. And now, here's the host of the show, Christine Blasdale. Welcome back to Out of the Box with Christine. I am your host, Christine Blasdale. And today, you are so lucky that you found this episode. I have joining me today, Mr. Jeffrey Shaw, who is a business coach to the self-employed. And if you've been listening to Out of the Box with Christine for any period of time, you know that we are all about entrepreneurs and empowering them to not only do really well in their business and and promote themselves, but also to have that holistic approach and feel good about what it is that they do, uh, their passion in life. And yes, be successful and make some money. That's always good. Um, Jeffrey has, oh my goodness, he, you know, he started off at the age of 14. I love this, Jeffrey, because (laughs) I think you and I as kids would have been friends. Mm-hmm. because you have an entrepreneurial spirit my mate um you, you started selling eggs door to door at 14 which led to a lifetime of self-employment and in your 20s uh you built a photography a portrait photography business and became one of the most sought after portrait photographers for uh, affluent families in the in the u.s you have also uh, been an, an amazing uh well-respected author of a book called lingo and the self-employed life you also have a podcast, so it's called the Self-Employed Life Podcast. We'll put a link in the show notes for that. And you've been a, a featured speaker, uh, at uh, a TED Talk speaker as well. So welcome to Out of the Box. Welcome to my world, because when I heard you were selling door-to-door eggs at 14, <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh, because I think I was about 10, and I started realizing that I could sell my toys <laughs> that I didn't want anymore <laughs> to neighborhood kids for cheap because awesome. I needed mm-hmm. candy. But, you know, um, we had that entrepreneurial, that, that the thing in common, that entrepreneurial spirit. So for welcome to the sure. show. And Thank welcome you. to my world. Glad to be here with you. And well, I'm glad to be in your world. Absolutely. Now, we, we had talked just before we hit record, we were talking about how you have this wonderful ability to see things. And this is probably because you were, um, a portrait photographer. And I love, I love you people <laughs> because, <laughs> because one of the most important things that I say with, with clients when they're starting a coaching business or a consulting business is I say, you better have a really good headshot. You need a really good photo. And they look at me like, well, but I have this selfie that I took it. You know? <laughs> I said, no, no, no. Because a really good photographer knows how to bring out the best in you and you being a coach for the self-employed, you also know how to bring out the best in your clients. Can you talk about how the the two the two businesses sort of um, have helped each other? Well, and, and in all transparency, I mean, for years, I didn't see the connection, right? So I had this, I built this successful photography business. I was all on location portraiture, uh, you know, for affluent families. And along the way, 20, about 25 years into that business, uh, I just got this bug to have a bigger impact in the world. Although, you know, looking back, it's almost humorous to me. It's like, there's really almost nothing of greater impact than creating legacies for families to hand down. Um, but I, there was something more I wanted, which is when I started pursuing coaching. But when I did like a lot of, a lot of entrepreneurs, I kind of, I, I kept them separate. You know, I had two separate websites. I used to joke. I felt like I was having an affair with myself (laughs) because it's like, I didn't want, right. I didn't want that business to know about this business or my client photography clients to know about his coaching, you know, because we live under this, uh, we live under this, this daunting thing that people tell us that if you try to do more than one thing, you can't be good at everything. How dare you? Yeah. Right. All that guilt. So I decided, you know, people couldn't find us. I kept them separate and it wasn't until honestly, from a, just a, 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 just a frustration, I said, I, I literally was sitting in a garden at my house in Connecticut where I lived at the time, early Sunday morning, and I just got so fed up feeling that pressure to keep these things separate. And I said, I'm one person. Why do I have to act like I'm more than one person? I'm one person who has taken a journey throughout my life to be authentic and whole. Why am I feeling the societal pressure to feel like I, I have to break myself apart? 
that's when I brought these things together. And then it has been a fun 15, 16 years of continuously realizing how my brain works a certain way, which may have brought me into photography. And then being a photographer for so many decades, mastered that brain in that just as a photographer, I see in people what they don't see. It's actually somewhat the topic of my TEDx talk too, because it's so unified in, in my core skill set. I see in people what they don't see in themselves. That helps with branding. That helps with creating their vision. It, it brings out their full potential. Uh, my photographer brain sees life in pixels, right? I just naturally see things in pieces and get so excited because I can imagine the whole. So I thrive in other people's chaos. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when, so when other people are feeling like I'm all over the place, I don't have a core message. I have five websites. I have 10 business. They're, you know, they're feeling, I mean, I hear it all the time. People will say, I feel like I'm all over the place, or I think I'm doing all the right things, but it's not coming together. I'm like, bring it on. That's where I thrive because I, my brain just like, okay, bring on all the pieces, kick up the dust. I can see something here that you're not seeing and where you can go with this. And, and that's the importance also of having a, a really a good mentor or coach is that they can see, because we're so used to, I just hit my microphone, sorry. You were so used to sort of being in the trenches, right? And we're going it alone. And, and sometimes those things that are really like, that are even obvious about us, we don't see because also we have those old childhood, you know, stories going on in our head whatever they may be. And we don't see the, what is it? We don't see the forest th through the trees or something like yeah. that. <laughs> Some oh, I have a better expression for you. Here's my expression for that, yes. which is also part of my, my uh, pitch for the lack of a better word of, of why people need to hire a coach, particularly when you're self-employed. My expression on that is you can't read the label from inside the jar. Mm. Right? And the reason I stress that is that when you are self-employed, you're running your own business, you are so far in the jar, like you can't even expect to read the label from inside the jar because you're taking it personal right there. We're, we're breaking up one of the conventional wisdoms that says business is business. Don't take it personal. When it's your business, it's all personal. And the more personal it is, the more you're in the jar, the harder it is to see from the outside what yeah, you know, how the world sees you and from the outside, what you need to, how you need to communicate to your ideal clients. It has to be done from the outside because you're too far in the jar. Oh, absolutely. And, and that is, that is, I would say what you've just, what you've just said and, and what we've been talking about is the number one problem with mm -hmm. most solopreneurs, entrepreneurs, coaches, consultants, uh, and things the like that. The number one problem is getting them to see it. You alluded to this a minute ago. Yes. The number one, it's, I'll tell you a quick story. When I launched my, my second book, The Self-Employed Life, of course, I, you know, as one should, I did my due diligence, right? I went to Amazon and I Googled books for self-employed, self-employed. I put in all the words, right? And the only books that came up were like really boring books about how to save taxes when you're self-employed, none of which any of us care about, right? Um, so I contact my publisher. I've got good news and I've got bad news. The good news is, is there is no book like the one I'm writing out there. Excellent. The bad news is I'm realizing at this point, I was 35 years in business and it's the first time I checked to see if there was a book for me. I said, <laughs> there's our, right? I said, so there's our marketing challenge. We are so used right. to going it alone that we don't even look for help. So my biggest marketing challenge in my books, the work I do, the Self-Employed Business Institute, my biggest challenge is getting people to see that they could use the help and stop reinventing the wheel. We have millions of, of business owners out there all trying to figure out the same puzzle and everybody's wasting time and energy and not getting to where they wanna to get to quick enough where just hire a good coach, hire a good mentor, get the right education, it can really expedite your result, your results. Oh, yes. Well, it's the same thing with, you know, I have, <laughs> we have so many people that are trying to, with social media, you know, you know, when you're, a, when you are self-employed, you have, you, you have to have a lot of different hats on. You have the accountant hat, you have the, you know, a management hat, you have the publicity hat, you have the social media hat. And so, what we're doing is we're running around trying to be all of these things and trying to do them well, right. Or hopefully, 
Yeah. At the same time, things are changing. So like with the algorithm, you know, that's the biggest thing is that when people go, but, but the algorithm, I need to know what the algorithm is. And I said, the algorithm will change this week. <laughs> it will change every day. It changes yeah. constantly. Yeah. And that's the idea. They don't want anyone to gain the algorithm or game it. Right. Yeah. So the thing is, is, is that the one thing that you do have control over is you, is your branding is the way you speak. It's the way you get out in the world. If you're going to be just in a basement and, you know, hope that people will one day walk by your basement and maybe look in the little window and say, oh, hey, what is it that you do? You know, you have to get yeah. out there. But and it's the but core message, about, and, right? It's the exactly. core. It's the core. And in most, and you and I, were, you know, we were chatting about this, you know, so many, particularly the people that I attract and I want to work with, and they are, they are, they're conscious business owners. And I say that because they're, they're, they're impact driven, right? So one of the things that we teach in the business Institute is an impact business model instead of an income based business model, because the people I attract like you are people that are first and foremost in business to make an impact, trusting the income will follow. And I'm all, all about that. Like I want the income to follow, but they lead with impact. And when you lead a business with impact, you have to realize that you are going to spend a fair amount of time putting energy, attention and money into something that isn't financially rewarding yet but you're gonna stick with it because of the impact that you can make in the world. Conventional business would tell you you're wasting your time, right? Conventional business would say, oh no, you, you know, make your, all your decisions based on ROI. That doesn't fit for us conscious business owners and impact makers, right? So, um, you know, that's just a, a reality of business, but your core message, if you can, you talked about all the hats. Here's a, 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 a tweet or a quote I put on my keynote sometimes. If you know your core message, you can wear all the hats and I'll hang on one hook, right? So it enables you, if you really get grounded in understanding what is the connection between all the pieces, the con between all the dots, even the multiple businesses, what's the connection between your life journey? If you can connect the dot and create a clear brand message that cuts through, at least cuts through to your ideal clients right? They get you, you get them. There's a connection. It's all you have to cut through. You don't need to, you don't want to cut through everybody. You want to cut through the people that you want to impact. And if you have that clarity of knowing what you stand for, whom you stand up for, one of the things we, we do in our marketing and our personal branding is something I call a standout statement. Okay. It's, it's a different version of a slogan or tagline because a standout statement comes from the inside and therefore brings energy with it. It's not a silly tagline, um, but the standout statement, its job is to let the world know what you stand for, whom you stand up for, and has to be compelling enough to stand out. That's how you cut through to your specific clients. Uh, and it enables you a tremendous, once you get that level of clarity, it actually gives you a lot of elbow room to grow and expand and serve multiple audiences. Oh, that's what you've just said is so key. It's so, I got goosebumps. I got the Blasdale goosebumps. Well, that, that's like the universe going, yes. <laughs> yes. I love that. And then you can rely on all of your expertise. And, you know, then you bring your suitcase full of all your knowledge and wisdom and, and years in the saddle. You know, um, I, I tell people, especially with, when it comes to working with clients and helping them create a podcast or, or having them be a guest on a podcast and getting them ready for that is that realize that I've been, been, I've been in broadcasting for 20 years. Mm -hmm. So I have a certain relationship with the microphone. I have a certain relationship with the audience, it, any audience. I can grab, give me a mic. I'm on it. That's mm -hmm. fine. But with them, sometimes they're a little, they're, they're like nervous about their voice. If it's video and we're trying to do a branding video and they're like, I hate, Oh my God, I'm on, ah, you know, <laughs> it's like, don't, you know, where you're at is where you're at. But I've had all these decades of experience that I can pull into and communicate with people. But with somebody who's just starting, it's if they have that clarity, like you were talking, mm -hmm. if you if you have that clarity of message, clarity of your passion and what it is that you want to do for the world, for clients, then it 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 kind of just oozes out of you. Do you know right. what I'm saying? And, right. And clarity of the way the dots connect. I'll tell you, a, yeah. a, one of my favorite examples of what you're saying, because you, so your, your broadcasting experience, that's your differentiator, mm -hmm. right? One of my, one of my students of the self-employed business Institute is about to come out with a book called bragging rights. 
crazily, her last name is Bragg. Her name is Lisa Bragg. It's crazy. Oh my gosh, that's her last brilliant. Name is Bragg. Brilliant. She's book of Bragg and Ray, but she's a journalist. Now, who better to speak on the topic of of journalism and and advocating for yourself, like reframing what it means to brag into a positive? Like, if you don't advocate for yourself, nobody else is, right? So, right. how do you do it tastefully? But one of my favorite examples, uh, Christine, of this is I met this guy in Clubhouse back when Clubhouse was cool. Oh, I um, remember that. I was remember a, that, that week? Was a blip. Yeah. <laughs> hey, remember that week? <laughs> <laughs> um. Anyway, so I met this guy, and I just I immediately invited him to be a guest my podcast because he um he had was talking about he had written a book called everyday legacy all right it sounds moderately interesting but not interesting enough that i'm going to invite him as a podcast until he also let us know that he is a former funeral director oh what a story what story who better to talk about legacy than a funeral director like i just feel like i wanted to know immediately like what have you heard people talk about in the back room what have you heard families you know regret the, for, about the person who passed or the amazing legacy that person left like to me there's just no better person to talk about legacy than a former funeral director yeah that makes him stand out from everybody else talking on the same topic and that's why you want to connect the dots and to get that clarity and you know and speaking of clarity and since we're both podcast um hosts of ter of terrific podcasts, I would say uh, so. Yes, um, I want to give the audience some. Let's give them some tips on how because a lot of times they say I want to be on a podcast. Okay, I I want to be a guest on a podcast, and um, that's great. But first of all, being on the right podcast is is important, right? <laughs> yeah. um, making sure that you listen to the podcast that you are pitching yourself to would help a lot. <laughs> yeah. And make sure it, they have guests before you pitch. Because yes. I made that mistake once. I'm going to admit to it early on. I like pitched myself to be a guest and wrote back and said, um, we don't actually have guests. We don't even so have like, guests. Oh. We do. <laughs> <laughs> it's just me. I'm like, oh, I blew that one. <laughs> well, a lot of times people, because they want to, they, they want to promote their book or they want to promote right. who they are, they'll like throw pasta at the wall and see what sticks oh. and right? it's so worse that, now than it's ever been yes. since the pandemic like it's we get 24 pitches a day and some of them just flat out don't make sense like crazy. so let's give them some tips because yeah. i at the 20 years at the radio station you know that i got pitched from publicists from authors from people walking down the street so that they would come in the office and go i need to be on your show I, yeah. I need, I've got things to talk about. And so um, let's give them some, some, let's Love give them to. some tips, shall yeah, we? I actually do. I believe so much in what you're bringing up that we actually have an entire class in the Business Institute. The last class, as I set them out in the world, the last class is, I, the class is called How to Be an Awesome Podcast Guest. <laughs> because I, on the, to my side, about nine and a half years of podcasting, 900 episodes, <sighs> it's amazing how <laughs> bad some guests are like they're just not helping themselves i mean they're not bad for the show when i say they're bad they wouldn't i wouldn't have broadcast it if it was a bad episode but they don't help themselves they're giving us great and this is this is one of the for tip number one if you're going to be on a, a podcast it's great that you generously want to provide value to the listeners but why are you doing it if you're doing it in any way as a strategy to build your business your recognition your reputation or sell a book that you need to help yourself accomplish that goal. Don't just come on the podcast and, and talk away because you're really not going to impress anybody that much that they're going to remember everything about you to, to find you and to find what you're trying to sell. So lead people there. Yeah. Oh yes. Don't sell. I it, it's in it's in it's hard. It's a dance. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's definitely a, a dance. I find that uh, when people uh, pitch, me to be on when it, either to be on the radio show in Los Angeles um, or the pro, the show I did in New York or even the, the podcast. Um, it's sort of the same type of thing, right? It's like a long email with all these words. And as a, as a podcast host or producer or radio host, you don't have a whole lot of time. What you want to do, and this is for those that are listening that want to be, um, that want to get on the get on air get on either radio or podcast make your pitch stand out and instead of doing the same thing of you know a long email and things like that um what i what i recommend is creating just even a short little video where the host can see your eyes can can hear you speak 
because you're going to be, it's all audio, right? Yeah. So, so have it so that if it's just real short, address them by their name and tell them why you're excited about being on their show and what you can share with their audience. And if it's got a unique spin to it and it's something that's again, short, don't do a long, you know, dissertation yeah. or anything like that, but no. something short, sharp, and to the Honestly, point. Honestly, anything longer than a, if a pitch comes through, and I, we, I actually look at everyone. So every pitch that comes in, we get about 24 pitches a day. And everyone wow. that comes in, um, my uh, assistant uh, replies to it right away and says, we get 24 pitches a day. If this has piqued our interest, we'll throw it into a folder and we will get back to you when we're ready. Please don't follow up. Because right. for every 24 new pitches, we're getting three follow-ups. Oh. It's too much, right? So we just tell people, please don't follow up because I will glance at it. And I personally glance at every pitch, but within seconds decide whether I'm going to go further. And one of the criteria is if that thing is longer than two paragraphs, I'm not even reading it. Exactly. Okay? Thank so you. I'm going to tell all oh my, I'm going to like replay this <laughs> clip to all my clients yeah. and go, you see? It's yeah, not just so, me no. who's saying so this. So first is the visual. If I it's visually visual. look at it and it's daunting, it's trashed. Okay. It's so don't visual. look don't look daunting. Second thing is I and and I'm gonna buck the system here a little bit for a lot of podcast hosts. I don't care if you've ever listened to a single one of my episodes. I really don't. It doesn't flatter me when you tell me that you listened to episode 831 <laughs> by so and so. I don't care if you've ever listened to another episode. I care about the content. So yes. what I want you to tell me is immediately, what is the connection between your core message and what my show is about? Because yes. I don't care if you're completely unknown. I don't care if you've ever listened to my episode. If you have an awesome connection to my topic and my audience, I'm interested. Yes. Nothing else impresses me. But don't be, don't be someone who's in a completely different field. Oh. And and then try. It's like a you know a very conservative Republican trying to get on a, a progressive you know. And to that point, I want to. I have never mentioned this before either, and I have mixed feelings on it because we have, thankfully, we have a lot of people who are stepping up that are, uh, you know, they're they're topic they're experts on topics relative to to women, women entrepreneurship, things like that. Love that, and I'm glad the support is there. The problem is they pitch out. They pitch to me how that very core idea like you know they're an expert on women entrepreneurship but my show is 50 50. so i don't I sometimes don't know what to do with that now by and large like my my clients my students at the business institute in fact our current cohort is all women as a coach eight to ten i'm coaching women more um but the podcast is 50 50. we've looked at the statistics we've surveyed so I will do shows every now and then that are specific to women's issues or women's entrepreneurship, but not very often. So I would say, you know, even if your area of expertise is gender specific or something really specific, can you broaden it, just yes. twist it a little bit, broaden it. So, yes. because I can almost guarantee you what you're saying has a lot of value to a broader audience. Absolutely. Right? For a podcast, stick to your genre, like, because they believe me, uh, the, you know, various uh, categories of life <laughs> um, need more attention. And we need to, I'm glad there are people stepping up as experts in various topics. But if you're going to be a guest on podcasts and the podcast is, has a broader audience, how can you take the incredible value of your topic and broaden it a little bit? So I, I can have an easier yes. It's hard for me to say yes to too many people that only speak on women's topics when I'm yes. a 50-50 uh, podcast. You have to be respectful of your audience, right? Right. Because I will do it every now and then. I've never done an episode because who needs it? I've never done an episode for men only. Who needs it? <laughs> right? Oh, I listen to those shows. <laughs> I don't do it, but I know, will do shows on for women only because it's it's more necessary and it's quite honestly it's who I I've care done more that. About. I've I've done that thing where I've you know I've gone through the thing and I'm looking and I go, oh, that looks like an interesting interesting name for this the clever names for podcasts. Mm -hmm. And I'll start to listen and I'll and I'll and I'll go and they're and they're talking about like you know sports. it gets a bro. <laughs> they're talking about that. It gets bro, uh, and then you're out of it. Yeah, me too. Yeah, bro, dude, bro. Yeah, dude. And I'm yeah. like, mm, no. As soon as I hear dude, it's not my show. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and another thing that helped, I mean, that moved people, because I did that, I had that stack as well, you know, of people wanting to be on the show. And um, especially for the radio show, um, what moved people up 
in addition to having a very clever short pitch or um, a video, um, I never answered the phone because I never answered the phone. I only answered my my wife and my mom's calls back then, <laughs> but um, was also if they had um, if they had a book, not just a book, but if they had a best selling book. And um, and because that was also something that I could as a producer and host uh, play off of. Right. Yeah. Of course, I will always check your website. I checked yours out. Yeah. Good. Jeffrey, I checked yeah. yours out. Nice website, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. But I wouldn't I do... change a thing. And I was looking, I was like, mm, 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 just, oh, oh, no, that's good. That's really good. Good. Glad <laughs> to hear that. <laughs> but to your point, like, and I do try to tell people, I mean, we've, you know, like, like your show, I've got a top rated show. Um, but your, your, your credibility matters, but not your acclaim. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's not, and I want people to feel comfortable pitching themselves if they're brand new in the world. And in fact, that's why I personally look at every pitch. I'm always looking for the, the golden needle in the haystack, right? I'm always looking for the person who's not all over everybody else's podcast when their book comes out. So, um, you know, don't hold back if you're really good at what you do, just because you might have the following yet. I, I'm not expecting you to promote it to your $100,000, uh, 100,000 social media followers. I don't care. I mean, really, I just want content. Um, so don't, I should, that's one thing I would say is people should not hesitate if they've done the work and they're clear on their core message, they're ready to get going. They have an impact they want to make in the world. Don't let any hesitation about you not having a following yet hold you back. Um, at least for me, I'm always looking for the, the golden needle in the haystack. And, and um, I just want it to be interesting and compelling. And don't be discouraged too if you don't if you don't hear back from you know from somebody that you've pitched. Yeah. Um, it may be that it's not the right you know th the right time for you, but also don't feel discouraged when you do get booked on a podcast and you you know if you if you <laughs> feel that your performance was less than stellar, um, because it's time in the saddle. Do you know, it's right. we're so used to as small business owners, as self-employed, as solopreneurs, we're so used to being in our insulated world, remember, in the jar, right? And yeah. we're inside. And so in our mind, we speak wonderfully. And we and we communicate <laughs> brilliantly. But when, you know, it's like when the on air light is on, or when you are when they go, Okay, we're recording. Yeah, Sometimes people can oh freeze Absolutely. up that's what i always I have notes every time for every book i mean i've published two books so far i'm working on the third one and every time i'm doing a podcast tour for either of the books i have notes all over in front of me on the computer because i'm lucky if i remember what i wrote a year or two earlier <laughs> right right i mean it's just it's true. It's, it's true and it's easy to forget your own <laughs> stuff i mean by nature of being business owners we're running in all the directions and chances are the podcast you're recording might be smack in the middle of your day and you're like brain switching don't there's no shame in reminding yourself what you know i don't i don't rely entirely on on my memory at all like it's okay to, to remind yourself what you know absolutely just one cardinal rule sin do not read no if you pick up a piece of paper and start reading Oof, i think you... that happen. <laughs> <laughs> and be able to talk. I, this is yeah. the other thing. This is, I'll tell you a story, Jeffrey. When um, uh, this was years and years ago, a publicist was pushing this, her, her client on me and said, this, this author is amazing. She's going to be great on your show. And I had like a drive time uh, slot in Los Angeles, which wow. is a lot of people. And yeah. so, so she said, she's going to be great. And I said, oh, okay. And she kept hammering me. Publicists, <laughs> there's a special yeah, place for them. The worst. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she kept hammering me. And I said, oh, well, let me look at it. And I looked at the title of the book and it was a great title. You know, I, I won't say the name of the title or even right. be close to it, but it was one of those things that it was like the title and the subtitle were so riveting that if you were in a bookstore, you'd grab it uh, and try and, you know, and flip through it because you'd, you'd want to buy it. Right. It was so intriguing. And so, and then I read the bio and, oh, she sounded very interesting and very accomplished. Great. And I did the mistake, though, of not hearing her before in any other interviews. 
And so I, so I had her um, on the show. She's the lights on, on air, blah, blah, blah. And I did this great introduction, you know, super duper introduction. And she proceeded to answer me in like literally one or two word replies. Wow. <laughs> and I said, this is going to be a long interview in my head. I'm thinking I will never ever have this person back on my, on my show. But what it was, was that even though she's a great writer, you might be a great author. You might be, yeah. I, I mean, you might be a wonderful coach, but if you, if you can't speak, don't go for the podcast. Don't go for the radio shows right. because it's going to make you look not good and you're not yeah. going to be invited so, back. Right. And so here's another tip. Now, something, especially when you're doing a volume of podcasts, every time I've launched a book, I've done like 125 podcasts in like a really in a matter of months or right? a very short period of time. So it's a lot. Um, and as I said, I don't expect people to have listened to my show. I can't possibly listen to all those shows, but I have a team that what I have them do is I have other people listen to all the other podcasts and I give them um a debrief sheet in that debrief sheet ask them some obvious things like okay when you when you, they listen to this show does the host call their audience by a name right so do they have a tribal name so i want to know that so i can use it um i ask about language right is it, it is foul language allowed encouraged or stay away from it right because i want to respect that um uh, my own show g-rated you know, I don't ever drop F bombs, but I can be on a show that does and I can play the game. And if that's their style, I'll make sure that I do. But here's my favorite question on the debrief form that I ask my listeners, um, the people listening to these podcasts for me. I say, how would I dress if I were to go see this podcast in person? Right. That tells me everything because is it a jeans and t-shirt kind of show? Is it a sport jacket kind of show? Is it a jacket and tie kind of show? If I can, plus I'm a complete clothes horse and spend way too much money on, on shoes and clothes, um, as, as one gay man should, but <laughs> the, um, I mean, it just comes with the card, um, you know, so, but I like knowing how would I dress because it completely sets in my vibe, how I need to show up for that show. Yes. If it's a jean and t-shirt show, I can, I can, I get a sense of how I can show up. My, I suspect that maybe this woman didn't do that kind of work. Like she didn't do the work, which we need to do as business owners for our clients as well. What's the vibe of those that you're serving and how do you show up for them? Right. Well, and also, you know, the publicist clearly just got the job, got the, got the gig yeah. and wanted to book as many appearances and, you know, uh, as possible. But I actually, I, I took her aside afterward and I just said, please, no one like this again, because it was yeah. literally like, I, 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 I would ask her a question and she would just, you know, like a super short sentence, like that was it. And I <laughs> sit there. It's not a conversation. <laughs> and so the whole interview was me talking about how, you know, well, it must be a really amazing being, you know, <laughs> I, was going, I was going crazy. That's hard. Wow. But yeah, you definitely, you know, be prepared to talk, be prepared mm -hmm. to, and, and, and here's another tip. Don't just talk about yourself mm -hmm. because if you want to talk about what you do for people or how people have been impacted by the work that you do, yes, that's great. But don't just talk about me, 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 I, I, I. That's one of my gripes that I have with beginner podcasters as well. Yeah. You know, when they have a show, if I am listening to the first minute, if I get there, and it's me, I, I, me, 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 I, 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 I'm gone. Yeah. I'm gone. Well, my podcast, my podcast team, my production team, like, you know, you can't help but be excited when a new book comes out or, you know, whatever's going on. They, and they, they have permission to do so. They will very frankly let me know, um, you're talking about the book too much, <laughs> like enough. <laughs> Right. And it's like, it's like, okay, I, thanks for reminding me to not be so excited about my new thing that you end up talking about it so much. So rely on other people, have other people let you know. And the other thing I'll say is when, especially if you're doing a volume of podcasts, I consciously go into a podcast trying to think, I call it a value bomb uh, because it reminds me like what value bomb can I bring to that episode that I haven't brought to other shows? Because if you if you develop a following and people start listening, and this what's our goal in business? Our goal in business is to build a following. Same thing with social media, right? There's your your 
your most devoted following is likely following you on multiple social media channels. So do you really want to be using a tool that pumps out the same post, the same message at the same time to all the platforms? No, because your, your most devoted people are actually seeing you in multiple places. Same thing with podcasts. If you, as you build a following, they're going to start following you and you don't want them to hear the same thing over and over again. They'll be satisfied if they, if they were to listen to 10 episodes that you're on, they'll be really thrilled if every time they listen to you, they get one tidbit, even if everything else is the same. If they walk away with one tidbit from each of those 10 episodes that they never heard from you before, you're, you're adding value to, to how they see you. So try to consciously not, especially when people come out with a book or something, they're, they're really inclined to say the same things over and over and over again. Try to figure out what one different thing can you bring to every episode. You're awesome. <laughs> that's what i brought to your episode <laughs> oh my gosh i you know i got we because we could talk forever and ever and i, I and an i want to have you back um so you're welcome back any any time but um let's let's tell people how they can get in touch with you because i know i'm personally i'm gonna reach i'm reaching out to you to help me with my messaging and um, and, and branding, because I know I've got all the, I've got all the goodies, right? Mm-hmm. I, I, that's, but I want to be really like, I want to be powerful and on point. And, yep. um, so I'm going to be reaching out to you. How can, how can others reach out to you? Um, so my main website is Jeffrey uh, that will lead you to, to all services and such. Uh, the other uh, website is self employed business institute.com. Uh, that is my five month curriculum, uh, of which is both a blend of group training and one-to-one coaching. Uh, and that is the education of being the business education of being self-employed because I got tired of a world where <laughs> the, after 15 years of coaching, I realized that as varied as my clients were in the industries they were in were so varied. They all had one thing in common. They were all really good at what they do, but they were in industries where nobody taught them how to make money at what they do. (laughs) And it's a huge problem in the world. We have all these skill sets that were, were taught and vocational schools and, but nobody's actually helping anybody make money at it. So that's why I launched the business Institute. So the, you can get this self-employed business Institute.com. So either place. Beautiful. We'll have links uh, to both of those in the show notes. And, um, and you're so, you're so right. Cause there's all these really talented, amazing human beings that are not making money. <laughs> we wow, need to it, help them. It because... kills me. It's like, they've got gifts. Yes. They've got gifts that need Absolutely. to be uh, supported. Mm-hmm. That needs to be supported. Right. Exactly. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. Again, you're welcome back to out of the box anytime. Um, I just enjoyed our conversation. I gained so much out of it and I know our listeners and our viewers on YouTube also did. So thank you again. And I want to thank you wonderful listeners on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, all those places. Um, Thank you so much for your continued support. Make sure that if this show resonated with you, share it with someone. Don't keep it to yourself. And especially those viewers on YouTube, remember to like, subscribe, follow, ring the bell, whatever you need to do to make sure that you don't miss a single episode. If you want more information about the podcast, go to outoftheboxchristine.com. And if you want more information about me and my coaching programs, you can go to christineblasdale.com. All those beautiful, delicious links are going to be in the show notes. And as I always say at the end of every show, don't forget to think outside that damn box. I think.